got me? Am I good now, Brother Danny? All right. I'm going to say a word of prayer. We're going to get started. I'm going to try to go quickly tonight and give you about 30 minutes. That way we can have our business meeting and, and we won't be here uh, till the sun comes up tomorrow. Okay. So I gave, tried, to, tried to cut some stuff out and, and just and go really, really quick tonight. We've only got 17 verses, which helps as well. So instead of the usual eight to nine pages, I think you got five today. So we'll, we'll, we'll shoot for 30 minutes. Okay. All right. So let's pray. And uh, we'll get started, but I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out tonight. Father, we're grateful, and we love you. And uh, I pray that you would be with us now as we study your word, that uh, you would uh, work in our hearts and minds, that you would preach and teach your truth to us, and that uh, if we find ourselves in places we need encouragement, I pray your spirit Provide that. If we find ourselves needing correction, Lord, I pray that your word do that to us. And I pray that you are honored and glorified through this and, we're, and that we're blessed through this. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, James chapter 4, we'll handle verses 1 through uh, six, or 17 tonight. Uh, but he essentially talks about two different things in this chapter. He talks about where you find your joy, and then he talks to us a little bit about what pride looks like in ourselves, right? So those are the, that's the big macro picture of where you're, you're coming from in this chapter. But, but by and large, the first uh, ten verses deal with the source of our, our joy in life. And he essentially says that, that you can find joy and in, in you can try two ways to find joy. One of them is the way of the world. Right? So you can try to find joy, satisfaction, success, peace through the way of the world. And the other way is, the, is God's way, is the way of the Lord. Okay, So those are our two options. And he looks and, and kind of jumps into what do these things look like as we flesh these things out. But in chapter 4, verse 1, James says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? And the word quarrels there in chapter 4, verse 1, basically carries the idea of like ongoing hostility, long-term anger with one another, long-term uh, hostility towards other people who are in the church. Uh, but... As I evaluate the grace of God and how he puts us together through his grace, that leaves little room for long-tenured, ongoing hostility between believers. It shouldn't exist in the church, and unfortunately it does. It existed in James' day. It exists in our day. Uh, I would like to pat Mount, pat Mount Gilead on the back. I feel like, by and large, we don't have large groups of people who have ongoing hostility towards one another, but I know uh, that it happens. So that's what the word quarrel means. What, why do you have this ongoing resentment and hostility towards other people in the church, right? So that's his question. And then he asks another verb or question in that, and he says, what causes fights among you? Fights, or, or that, that would be like an outburst of anger, like you, you've lost your temper very quickly. So, so why are you losing your temper with one another so hastily and why do you have these ongoing never ending disputes and, and anger towards one another all right and he answers his his question with a question at the end of ch chapter uh, 4 verse 1 he says is it not this that your passions are at war within you all right so the word passions there essentially means uh, our self desires is not our own selfishness causing us to act this way all right. It's not our own selfishness causing us to have hostility. It's not our own selfishness causing us to have uh, eruptions of anger. All right. And that's where James uh, focuses. All right. uh, so in, in James's environment, everybody there thinks themselves to be the priority. Okay. So what I want and what I see that I need trumps everything that you want and that you need. Okay, so I'm the priority, all right, uh, therefore I should get first choice, okay? So 
I really think that the way we worship, uh, should, we should have no hymns. No hymns ever. We only have the, the, the new stuff, the 7-11s, all right? If it ain't 7-11, it ain't for me, okay? And because I'm most important, that's the way that, that it's going to be, right? Well, then the next person over here is going, well, no, I'm more important than you. And if it ain't in the Baptist hymnal, we ain't singing it. Okay, so you've got these ongoing things going on in churches, right? Uh, the word passions there, uh, if you want to get into the Greek there, that's where we get our word hedonism, okay, which means pleasure or joy or satisfaction, right? So that's essentially what he's saying is, is what causes these fights among you? Is it not this, that your, your selfish desires for joy, your self-desire for satisfaction, is, is causing you to fight with one another. All right, verse 2. He says this, You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And James gives us a great verse on contentment here. Right? He gives us a great verse on contentment. He uses the word murder in that verse. I don't think he's literally talking about murder. I don't think they're whipping out machetes in the business meeting and, 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 and hacking on each other because they're so upset. But what I think he's talking about here is, is kind of what James teaches on the, or Jesus teaches on the Sermon on the Mount, right? That, it, you know, you say don't kill, don't murder, but if you are, are hating in your heart, that's the, that's the sin, the root of murder there, and you're just as guilty of that, okay? And I think that's what... James is talking about here. I don't think he's talking about literal physical murder necessarily, but I think he's talking about the fact that uh, we're wishing people were dead. We could say it that way. He says in this verse, in verse 2, you desire, you don't have, you covet, cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel, you do not have because you do not ask. I think the main thing that this church was guilty of is they had elevated their wants and their own desires above a place of prayer in their life. And we should not do that. We should not live that way. If, we've, if we spend more time trying to figure out how to get all the things that we want in life for ourselves, if we spend more time doing that than we do praying, then we've got a spiritual problem, if that makes sense. If I spend my whole day trying to figure out and be cunning and, and, you know, how do I get the best new deer rifle? But I never spend any time on my knees. I got a spiritual problem. And that's what James is talking about there in verse 2. So he's encouraged us to be content there. Verse 3, it says, You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions, your personal joys, your personal satisfactions. Okay? Here's a quote from one of the resources I read by Ellsworth. He says, as we survey modern day Christianity, we are compelled to admit that many of those who profess to be believers do not appear to be in agreement. We're disagreeing all the time. We have the same characteristics that James is describing here. We're supposed to believe these things, meaning biblical truths, is what he was talking about earlier. But many, but many do not give evidence of, of doing so. The sad fact is, is that many church members appear to be working against the very things that they are supposed to value and prize. And that's where we find ourselves in today's environment. That the, the, the things that we should value and prize as believers, things that are described and prescribed in God's word, are a lot of the times the things that, that quote-unquote Christians are arguing against. Right? Like, like a biblical idea of marriage. Biblical thoughts on life, whether it be in the womb or for the elderly. All right? Biblical thoughts and ideas regarding equality. Those things that we see in Scripture and we should treasure, a lot of times we find the church fighting against those very same principles we should love. When it comes to verse 3, it says you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. I think it's important to remember that God does not exist to feed us 
all our wants, and he does not exist to make all of our dreams come true. Right? That theology, is the, the health, wealth, prosperity gospel is very prevalent in our culture today. Right? And that is not the gospel. God is not a divine Santa Claus who sits up in his throne room in heaven with a sack of toys that he just wants to dish out to me. Right? And as long as I'm a good boy or as long as I have enough faith, God will just dish out those gifts and presents to me. It's not why he's here. God's here to build his kingdom, not, not my kingdom. Okay. Verse 4. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So the church that James describes in verses 1 through 3 there is just pretty much useless when it comes to accomplishing things for God's kingdom and making God's name great. Right? If we're spending all of our efforts worried about ourselves, it's not only just the church, but it's me as an individual believer. If I spend all of my time worrying about myself, I've pretty much become useless in God's kingdom too. So I've got to take my eyes off of me and put them on, on what God is doing in the world. All right? But how can we minister in God's name when we're only concerned about our own name? It, it, those two things can't go together. But instead of fighting with each other because we're selfish, instead of holding hostility and grudges towards each other because we're selfish, this is what Jesus said in John 13. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. And what's the result of that? By this, all will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. What I'm trying to say here is if we live in the state of, of constant selfishness where we're arguing with, with each other, the world can't look at us and go, hey, those people are different than me. Those, those people have something that I don't have. If the world looks at a church and they are backbiting, if we're arguing, if they're angry with each other all the time, and they look at the church and go, the church is no different than my place of employment or my family reunion. Okay? They're not, they don't have anything to offer me that I don't already have. We've got to be different. We've got to love one another. So in the verses that follow, James confronts the really casual approach to discipleship that a lot of us display. Oh, I'm just, I've just been mad at this Christian brother for 30 years. It's okay. Not a big deal. We don't talk to each other. Sit in the same Sunday school class, but we don't, don't, don't talk to each other, right? Uh, you know, uh, those types of things. We, we, we try to give ourselves a pass when it comes to those things. But James, when you get to verse 4, he kind of really identifies the heart of the issue. And quite frankly, he speaks very harshly to the church, right? So we would say, this is a little problem. We're having some relationship issues in the church. James doesn't look at it that way, all right? Let me read verse 4 again. You adulterous people. It's probably not the best way to build a sinker-sensitive church, all right? All right? You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God, all right? So what James is saying is this is not a casual issue. This shouldn't be swept under the rug, but what we're having here, this is spiritual adultery and spiritual war that's going on, right? You, you are choosing the opposite side, and you have strapped on your shield and spear, and you're trying to go against the kingdom of God. It shouldn't be that way. You claim to be married to God. You claim to be married to the church, but you're hating one another. Uh, you're living for yourself. That's spiritual adultery. That's not spiritual faithfulness. That's spiritual adultery. Verse 5, or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? Let me stop right here and I think we could all give a hearty amen and say thank you to God who pursues us with great resolve, even in our times of greatest rebellion. Even in our times where we have the, 
the, the the hardest spiritual head that we could ever have, God still pursues us with His Spirit. I think that's a great source of praise. Now, theologically speaking, a true believer cannot live their life continually ignoring the call and conviction of the Spirit. It can't happen. Okay? That's one of the things that James says here is that as Jesus pursues you in your selfishness, as Jesus pursues you in your sinfulness, right? He is drawing you back to yourself. He is putting the spirit of conviction on you. At some point in time, that's got to work. If it's not working, then your salvation is in doubt. And that's what James says, all right? But I'm thankful that God loves us too much to let us persist in our own ideas of worldliness. I, I have testimony firsthand of, of God bringing me back when I was much younger. And I'm thankful for that. I'm grateful for that. I'm glad God didn't leave me to just keep on going the way that, that Michael was going several, several years ago. In verse 6 it says, but he gives more grace Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So the proud are those who turn their hearts away from God to another rival, something that's in the world. And the humble understand and practice total dependence on God. And I think that is our mission as believers, that each and every day we wake up with the goal, with the mindset to grow in total dependence upon God. That's a sentence that's easy to say, but that's something that's hard to live. That we're going to be completely dependent upon God in our lives. James continues and says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The solution to our worldliness in the church is not to try harder. The solution is submission. This is probably one of the greatest spiritual truths that, it, that I've ever come to realize in my life. If you are battling the world in your mind, if you are battling sin in your body, the way you get rid of that is not to try harder, but to submit more. That's what James says. By us submitting to God, it puts our hearts in a place where the Spirit can move and work. The word submission there basically means to subject our will to his control. In other words, instead of me running my life today, God, you're running my life today. I am waving a white flag in front of you where you have control of my life. But we submit ourselves to a particular source. We submit ourselves to God, right? I think the quicker we realize this truth, the better off we'll be. And then James says, resist the devil, he will flee from you. That's a military metaphor. It basically means to, to get your stuff ready and to stand firm, not to leave your post, not to run away. That's the, the, the word that, that is used there when we say resist the devil. Okay, We are to stand firm against him. We are to stand firm against temptation. We were to stand firm against the attacks of the devil, all right? We, we, we refuse to surrender to sin, and instead we surrender to God. But a lot of times we get that backwards. A lot of times we surrender to Satan, we surrender to sin in our life, and we resist what God's trying to do. All right, but James says, you're getting those things backwards. Let's submit to the Lord and resist Satan, all right? Verse 8, draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The word draw near or phrase draw near has these, the background imagery of, of approaching God in, in, in deep worship and a uh, resolve to follow him. Okay, that's what the word draw near means. And then he gives you two pictures here. Of, of the opposite side of the coin. So on one coin, we're drawing near, and then on the opposite side of the coin, we are cleansing our hands and purifying our hearts. Both of these things get us moving in the right direction. Both of these things get us involved in the kingdom of God. Both of these things get us 
involved and growing in our relationship with Christ. But cleansing your hands, that kind of highlights moral purity, action. Okay, I shouldn't act in a way that is ungodly. I shouldn't act in a way that is unholy. All right? And purify your hearts, that has to do with the inside of me, my inner integrity. Because we all know that we can act a certain way, but on the inside we think something else. Hence the phrase, bless your heart. Right? But when we say bless your heart, we really don't mean bless your heart. Okay? In Scripture, our hands and hearts are intricately connected. They, they don't exist separate from one another. I can't have the right actions and a bad heart and be okay. Likewise, I can't say that I love Jesus and never change my life. If, if, if I'm truly repentant, I can't just say I'm sorry and mean it on the inside. There ought to be some actions that follow through. There ought to be some changes that, that come in my life. Does that make sense? So, for the same reason, James says faith and works are connected earlier. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. So are our hearts and hands when we talk about re repentance. To so just like James says, hey, you cannot have a genuine faith without some kind of fruit or evidence or work that goes along with it that says, hey, this guy's the real deal. This lady right here, I can tell she loves Jesus. She doesn't just say it, but I see it in her life. Okay, so in that same way, when we come to God and say, God, I'm, I'm coming to you turning from this sin, and I mean it, then there will be some follow through with our hands and feet. Okay. Uh, a believer cannot be genuine in seeking forgiveness and not change a sinful action which prompted the need for grace in the, in the, in, in the first place. Right? Verse 9, be wretched, mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Here in this verse, James uses these three words, wretched, mourn and weep, and he calls for sinners to have e experienced deep feelings of shame because of our disobedience. This is something that is completely missing from our culture right now. Okay, we take sin very, very lightly in our culture. And it's because we see sin the way other people see sin. We don't see sin the way God sees sin. It is a serious matter. It is a death issue. So we need to take sin seriously. Instead of feeling shame for sin, our culture flaunts it. We don't have gay shame parades, but we have gay pride parades. It shouldn't be like that. Verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord. He will exalt you. Minds that are informed by the truth of God, and choices that are made according to the will of God, and affections that are set on the things of God, all will issue into behavior that is pleasing to God. Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to take everything we talked about in that verse and put it together. If our, if our minds are in gear, our hearts are in gear, our hands should be in gear, that's going to get my life headed in a godly direction. Right? Verse 11. We start to talk about pride and what that looks like now in our life. So we've, we've kind of looked at uh, two ways to find joy. You can find joy in trying to find it in the way that the world wants you to have it. And all that's really going to make you do is angry. It's going to make you uh, angered. Uh, it's going to make you selfish. You're going to try to use God in a way that gets you what you want and that doesn't work. Or you can come to God in humble submission and repentance and say, God, I need you. You're in control of my life. Right? And I tell people all the time, I, I've lived my life both ways. I've done it Michael's way, and I've done it God's way. And for some reason, that's really weird to me, I got a lot more, more joy and peace in my life when I do things God's way. Okay? That's, that's James's purpose there in those verses. Verse 11, we start to talk about pride. He says, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. Pride is a funny thing. We can easily spot it in others, but we can't see it in ourselves. 
So some, some of the proudest people I've ever met thought of themselves as being very humble. And they're also very critical of the pride that they see in other people. But I, I think at the end of the day, a lot of us are more, more proud of ourselves than we like to first admit. When, when we judge, the meaning there is to find fault with him. Or when we, we speak against a brother, right? The one who speaks against his brother. What, what does that term mean? It means I'm finding fault in a person and I'm, I'm gossiping or, or I'm tearing that person down with my speech. Okay? That's, that's one of the, the surefire, surefire ways of, of knowing I got a pride problem. If I'm always talking bad about people and I'm never talking good about people, I got a pride problem. That's what James says. So pride is essentially when I elevate myself, my behavior, my thoughts above others. Okay? You're not as good as me, so I'm going to talk bad about you all the time. I'm going to gossip about you all the time. When you're not around me, I'm going to tear you down all the time. Which I tell my girls at home, if you have a friend that does that, you need to be careful what you tell them. Because they're going to, they're, when you're not around, they're going, they're going to tear you down too. All right. So when I elevate myself, that results in me trying to judge their worth and me judging their heart, and that's God's job. That's what James says. Verse 12 and 13, there's only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy, but, you, uh, but uh, who are you to judge your neighbor? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there and trade or make a profit. All right, so the first way we, we have this litmus test of pride is the way we judge and, and talk about others. The, the second way is how we the second way is found in our independence, if I could say it that way. All right? That comes in verse 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a town, spend a year there, trade and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. In general, mankind, we really forget about the brevity of life. All right? So I'm, I'm 48. Right? And I know some of you are going, oh, such a babe. Okay? But in my mind, I feel 28 until I jump out of the back of my truck onto the ground and, and my knees pop. I go, 48. Right? And you're probably the same way. You may be 78, but you don't ever feel 78. You may feel 58 or 68. You see what I'm getting at? But we, we forget how fast life moves. Right? I'm reminded of this, like, with, with, with my girls. There, there was this, there was, my girls all change in one day. Like, there's just like the specific day for girls where they're really little, and then they come through the house, and then they look grown. I don't know what happens. I don't think boys do it like that, but that's, that's how girls develop, Right? And I'm reminded of that when, when I talk in my Sunday school class now. So I'm, I'm teaching the early 20s in, in Sunday school now. And some of them don't have children. Some of them are getting married. Some of them just have one little baby, which my sister-in-law says having one child is basically, basically like an accessory. You just dress it up and carry it around with you, and it, it's like a purse. Everybody thinks it's cute. Okay? Uh, that's the stage of life they're in. And I look at them and I'm teaching them and it goes, it was just yesterday that I was there. Right? Life is short. It is a vapor. We do not know what tomorrow holds. That's what James is teaching us. So it's very prideful of us and we are being very independent from God when we say, hey, next year I'm going to do this, 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 and this, and this. All right? And we never consider God in the equation. Okay? But the fact of the matter is, we simply exist because Christ wills it. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. For by him, talking about Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. The reason you can have a next year is because Jesus wants you to. 
But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. I think at the end of the day, everything we do should be done in prayer and submission to God's authority and sovereignty over us. He is in control, not us. And how can a person who does not know what tomorrow brings boast in personal accomplishments like we had had it all planned the whole time? All right? The fact of the matter is, is that all things are in God's control. And then in verse 17, James says, So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. But James gives us this closing reminder here, this catchphrase at the end of chapter 4, all right, that reminds us that life is short, so you act on the, conviction, the convictions of the Spirit in your life, and you trust God every day. That's what chapter 4 is about. All right? Uh, I'll say a word of prayer, and then uh, Brother Bradley's will come and, and get us started in our uh, quarterly uh, meeting time. God, I love you, and I thank you for today. And I, I am probably more guilty than anybody else in this room about just planning my life and, and living my life and making my plans and, and not thinking that uh, I may not even be here tomorrow. So I want to acknowledge that this day is a gift from you. And God, I want to acknowledge that if I'm breathing tomorrow, that day is a gift from you. So God, I pray that, that we use each day for your glory, not our own. In Jesus' name, amen.